Faithful and loving God, we give you thanks for the gift of your word. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear and to receive the gift of your word for us this day. And may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Now, Ken, have you read chapter six of Numbers? Yes. You have, you did, that was your first one. Okay, so then I am up with selected verses from Numbers 11. The rabble among them had a strong craving. And the Israelites also wept again and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servants so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give birth to them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a sucking child to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where am I to get meat to give to all this people? For they come weeping to me and say, give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all this people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, gather for me 70 of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting and have them take their place there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. And he gathered 70 elders of the people and placed them all around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put it on the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And the young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, son of Nun, the assistant of Moses, one of his chosen men said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the people, Lord's people were prophets, and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Who remembers Star Trek? The TV series, not the movies, the TV series, all right? Who remembers Spock, the Vulcan, all right? Who remembers his greeting, the Vulcan greeting? Live long and... Prosper. Who remembers the hand motion that you make with it? Can you make that? That comes from the book of Numbers. No, seriously. We'll get to that later. But that comes from the book of Numbers. Memories and stories of early periods in our lives are paradigms for understanding and traveling through later chapters. They're sources of wisdom. You know that's true from your own experience. So attorneys tell stories about being in law school and doctors tell stories about their residency and teachers tell stories about their internships and uh, military officers tell stories about candidate school and enlisted office p uh, personnel tell stories about boot camp. These stories are paradigmatic and grandparents say to grandchildren when i was a child and why do we do that it's a way of trying to touch into, into inherited wisdom um, there really is something 
positive behind that as well. And that's the book of Numbers. It's trying to give us inherited wisdom. And that's why we're looking at it today. You've heard the quote, life is best appreciated as a journey, not as a destination. And that's the book of Numbers. It's the remembered stories of the, desti- of the journey in the wilderness. It's, it's the fourth book in the Bible. It's the fourth book in the Pentateuch, or the Torah, as it's called in Judaism. And it's the account of what happened after God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses out Mount Sinai. And then the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. For how long? 40 years. 40 years. For 40 years they wandered before they got to the Promised Land. And Numbers gives us the stories of what happened while they were in the wilderness period. And wilderness stories, stories of trial or times of uh, testing, they tend to be disproportionately impactful as paradigms and inherited wisdom. And that's a big part of why we remember them and why we go back. We're after the wisdom in them again. The stories of what happened when they wandered in uh, the wilderness preparing to enter the promised land. As history, it's about 3,300 years old. Uh, that's when it purports to be giving us a historical look at. It's um, uh, about 1,300 years before Christ. And in terms of geography, it starts when the uh, Israelites, I'm trying to do this backwards, it reverse for you all, when the Israelites cross over the uh, peninsula, cross through the sea into the Sinai Desert, the Sinai Peninsula, which goes down at the bottom um, to uh, Mount Sinai, and then they come up headed east along the Sea of Arabah to where that intersects between uh, Israel and Jordan today, and, and then they go up along the side of what we would call Western Jordan, uh, the country of Jordan, or the eastern bank of the Jordan River, and they wander along in there for about another 20 years, what the Bible calls the Plains of Moab, and finally they enter the Promised Land between Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee at a city called Jericho. You remember, Joshua fit the battle there. And so Numbers is all of the time and events in between. It's called Numbers in English because there are two censuses of the people in it. But in Hebrew, it's called the desert time or in the wilderness. And it tells the story of what they did to get ready to take possession of the promised land. It involves their adventures and their lack of faith along the way and instructions for them on how to get along, how to worship together, and how to live together. And that's why it's impertinent to us, because of the wisdom about how to get along, how to live, how to be together. And it also includes the story as you travel about the grumbling. Do you know the reference for Sausage Sunday is in the passage Nicole just read? It is. (laughs) The people grumbled, we want meat, give us meat. That's what it says. So we're giving it to you today, but Nicole will tell you a little bit more about the grumbling. How many of you have complained or grumbled, either out loud or inside your own head already this morning? You're amongst friends. We are told we are to confess, right, before God and before one another. I was only at home awake for about an hour and a half this morning. Only one person in my house, my spouse, was awake. He was gone for half of that time walking the dog, and I still managed to complain and grumble to him before I left the house at 7.30 this morning. You're amongst friends. Complaining and grumbling is something that we do, isn't it? It's something that we have done for all time. We've heard that in the book of Exodus, and we hear that again in the book of Numbers. One of the shifts that happens in the book of Numbers happens in the 11th chapter, which I read portions of the text this morning for you. Some of those narratives and themes should sound familiar, because we are hearing them again, again and again and again. There is repetition. Everything has been laid out for these people, for us. Everything has been Uh, choreographed so that it could become a beautiful, uh, graceful dance, this people moving through the wilderness into the promised land. Everything has been choreographed and laid out for us to move through this 
life in beautiful and in wonderful, dignified, holy, orderly ways, and yet it doesn't. It's not what happens. It's still not what happens. Trouble happens. There is grumbling and there is complaining. The word that the NRSV uses um, is translated rabble, the rabble amongst them. Well, this Hebrew word rabble can also be translated as the riffraff, the riffraff amongst the bodies, which, make no mistake, is not always someone else. I think we always take our turn at being the riffraff. At some point or another, we are all in that collective. We are all giving voice to grumblings and to complaints. In this instance, the riffraff is lifting up their frustration at Moses' leadership. They are fed up with the hardships of life there in the wilderness, and they have a great deal of nostalgia that what John was lifting up, the grandparents, well, in my day, right, that nostalgia, the nostalgia is what is a comfort to them. That's what they want. We want the nostalgia. We want the things that we remember back in Egypt. They have forgotten all of the horrible things in Egypt and how hard and difficult life was. They remember maybe some forms of reality, but also they've recreated this narrative in their mind, and it's better than what it actually was in reality. We see this theme unfold over and over again in the book of Numbers. We see the people complain about their misery in the wilderness or about Moses' leadership or about both. God then becomes angry and reacts. Moses then steps in and intercedes on the people's behalf and then God's wrath gives yield. It's scaled back. Through these grumbling scenes, Numbers captures, I think, both the blessing and the burden of community life. There is both blessing and burden to being in community. Some of the grumblings that happen in the book of Numbers happen from a place of entitlement, a desire from the people for immediate results for immediate satisfaction of whatever it is that is ailing them. These particular grumblings are seen as unfaithful, and God deals with the people's unfaithfulness. An example of this is that first generation, they do not make it into the promised land. Future generations will make it into the promised land. That first generation remains in the wilderness. Other complaints, though, other complaints come from the courage to give voice to injustice, to things that should not be. The rules and the regulations that had been set forward by the laws, which we've explored in preceding weeks, well, they were intended to bring order to the community. But they also presented, as they were lived into, some questions. Like the questions that is brought forward in the book of Numbers by the daughters of Dezalophahad, who ask whether women may receive land if there are no male heirs. These women go to Moses and point out that according to the law, their father's name will be lost because no one from his family will receive an inheritance from the land. Moses hears their question. Moses takes their question to God and God responds. In response, God gives a new law, a new interpretation of the law. Laws intended that the people may be pure and holy can and do change in order that they may function to bless the community and not harm or hinder parts of them. If Moses and God both listened to the complaints, some being a whine, while others being cries for justice. And they're moved to respond, and they're moved to react to the people's suffering. Then I think that we too are called to listen to the suffering of others. We too may be called to change and to adapt in order to live into the full intention of the law, which is that it might be a blessing to one another 
and not a burden. And the book of blessings gives us one of the most beautiful scriptural blessings I think there is. She's right. It's the most famous blessing. It's in number six. And it's the place where God tells Moses to tell Aaron, the high priest, when you bless the people, bless them like this. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forever. Does it sound familiar to you? It should be familiar because you've been hearing it for years. We use it at the end of many worship services still today. And we use it at the end of most weddings as we pronounce them over the couple being married and before we send them out to live their married life together. We use it at the end of most memorial services as we entrust our loved ones into God's everlasting arms. Say it with me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And this blessing was then the one that the priests were taught to pray at the high moments over the people as a means of God's goodness, God's goodwill, God's good intentions, God's encouragement, God's power, God's love flowing. We were the instruments of the blessing. It's God's blessing. But we're the instruments. Who is God asking you to be an instrument for God blessing today? This is the blessing still that at the Shabbat, the uh, Friday evening Sabbath as it begins, Jews will, in their own homes, recite over their children. Has anybody ever seen this? Well, some of you have been in the homes at Shabbat of Jewish friends and sundown when they light the candles. If you've seen the movie Fiddler on the Roof, then you, then you remember this scene. It's when they're lighting the candles and they come over the children and they sing, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. And may you be in Israel a shining light forever. Remember? Tell me somebody remembers that scene in the movie. <laughs> Please say yes, kid. Yeah. <laughs> well, you should remember this blessing because it's the paradigmatic blessing for all blessings, and it still functions that way today. In the year 1979, in an archaeological dig in Jerusalem, there's a burial chamber. It's actually now underneath the Church of Scotland, the Reformed Church, Presbyterian Church that's built there. They've known about this burial chamber for a long time, long enough that now they use it for field trips. And at one field trip, there's a professor of archaeology explaining it to the middle school students, and there was a 13-year-old. Anybody 13 years old here today? Yes, there's a 13-year-old, all right? So this 13-year-old was named Nathan, a boy, and he was such a distraction that the professor sent him over in a corner of the room to look for stuff, just to get him out of the way. And he fell through and discovered a burial chamber that they had never found before. And inside this burial chamber, they found the remains of a 13-year-old girl buried there, 13-year-old Israelite girl from about the year 600 BC. And they could date these things through carbon dating with pretty close precision. And on her wrist, her parents had placed in a silver amulet a piece of scripture. And it was these words, the Lord bless you and keep you, the Lord make his face to shine upon you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you now and forever. It is the oldest hard copy piece of scripture that we have. It's not to say it's the oldest scripture. Some scriptures are older, but we just have more recent copies of them. But in terms of the actual oldest hard copy scripture, it's this one from number six on those silver bracelets. And now they're in the Museum of History in Jerusalem. You can see them. Uh, I've been to see them there. I, I find that very moving. I mean, the oldest piece of scripture that we found could have been anything. It could have been and Aaron had to go back to the 40 acres to get the donkey, right? It could have been. Or it could have been, and Miriam went over to clean a pot out. And when you clean pots out, wash them three, but it's not. The oldest piece of scripture that we found is, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and lift up his countenance upon you. To me, I, I think that's the long arm of God's providence confirming this blessing at work still amongst us still. 
Leonard Nimoy was Jewish, and he remembered as a boy how the priests, the rabbis, would raise their hands and in the pattern of Moses hold their fingers like that when they did the blessing. And so he plagiarized it for the Vulcan greeting. That's the truth. In this, Nicole. <laughs> What if the oldest scripture had been that thou shall not eat meat from animals with divided hooves? Then we could not justify sausage such a Sunday. glorious yeah. Sunday like Sausage <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> the long arm, the long reach of God's providence. God continues to desire to bless God's people that they may live fully and faithfully. We've seen this repeatedly from these first four books of the Bible as we journeyed through them together since the first of the year. And we will continue to see God respond to the needs of God's people in order to be in good and right relationship with them. In order for us to be in good and right relationship with God and with one another. This doesn't make the laws that we have read about irrelevant. As Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, but that the law might be fulfilled through me. As a church of Jesus Christ, we continue to be called to live a holy and a faithful life that we may bless God and that we may bless one another. And so we come to this table that we might be fed for this communal life together.